Hi guys, welcome to my channel, Physician Assistant Study Buddy, where we discuss everything PA related. In today's video, I will walk you through my test taking strategies that were a game changer for me when it comes to test taking in PA school. I only wish somebody has shared something like this with me before I started PA school. It would have had helped me with my grades, it would have reduced my test anxiety, Guys, this could easily be the best tip you're going to hear when it comes to the studying in a PA school and test taking. My name is Mesha. I'm a new grad PAC working in neurosurgery ICU. <laughs> Honestly, without a question, the hardest part of PA school was the first semester. I was still figuring out how to study, how to prepare for tests, figuring out how to spend time with family. Basically, it was the worst semester and my lowest grades by far. The biggest reason for that was that I was approaching testing in a completely wrong way. God, it was awful. Basically, what I did, I would approach the question and read the whole stem from the beginning. And some stems can be so long that by the end of it, I would literally forget what was said in the beginning. And I would have to go back and read it again. For those of you in school that are right now, you guys know what I'm talking about. I will show you how to resolve that. And I remember looking at that clock and it's just ticking and I'm thinking to myself, Oh my God, I literally have 8 minutes to go and 12 questions. That led me to look at the next question, and if the stem was long, I will be just like, forget about it, answer is C. Today, I will show you how to avoid that and take the test like a champ. So what I did is I researched test taking strategies, and I talked to the class above and some of the faculty members. They all shared their experience with me, and I came up with this approach that has worked like a charm for me when it comes to the test taking uh, in a PA school. I used it during my didactic year later, I definitely use it for my EOR and for my pants. My grades dramatically improved and my test taking anxiety was reduced to minimum. Go ahead and try this strategy with whatever platform you guys use to practice. Could be Rosh Review, could be other books, whatever. Hopefully, you'll see how much time you'll be able to save, how much more accurate your answer selection will be. It worked for me, it may not work for you, give it a shot and if it doesn't, stick to what works for you. Guys, another huge factor that helped me implement this strategy is that during those first few exams in the first semester, I kind of noticed there was a pattern when it comes to the test questions that we were asked. And it seems to follow the same formula. They will give you a stem, something short statement, sometimes long, with some tricky leads along the way. And at the end, they would always ask you a question. And those questions were always basically the same. What's the next best step? What's the most common? What are the side effects of this medication? What's the best treatment options? Which syndrome is this? What bug is this? Next best step imaging. With that in mind, st my studying changed. When I was studying my class notes and lectures, I would go through my slides and some classes had like a hundred plus slides, which is super overwhelming. And some of the lectures were shorter, but some of them longer. But basically, you will go through eight lectures and get tested. That's basically about five questions per uh, lecture so with that in mind i started differently i also went through my classmates uh study guides i would read them once maybe twice but i would definitely go over my slides from the class and what tremendously made a difference for me is to start looking at those slides from the test creator point of view i would look at them and be asking myself is there a question on this slide some teachers were nice and they would bold important parts but not all so with that in mind i will look at a slide and i'll be like is there a question here if, you know some of those would be like most common so forth so i start making flashcards with what's most common what's the treatments what's the side effects basically my faster equal questions and i would go over and over and over those questions and they helped me so much when it comes to the strategy that i covered uh in this video and i hopefully you will like them as well these improved my grades they saved my study time and allowed me most importantly to spend more time with my family. I will make a video on each class from PA school with these fast equal questions, see how they can help you as they help me and how they can probably help you improve your scores. Uh, today you will see how these fast equal questions implement in the strategy and the way I organize them. I also organized all of these uh, study slides from sections from didactic EOR and PANS. I created a book with each 
uh, didactic EORM pens. You can check those on Amazon. I'll leave a comment down below. But now let's go through some of these practice questions and you'll see how these fast recall questions and my test taking strategies works like a charm. So congratulations to making a PS cool. You're doing great. Uh, let's begin with some practice questions. So what I do is how I approach a question for all the tests, didactic, EORs, pens, is I read the last sentence first. And when I'm done reading the last sentence first, I glance over the answers. And with that in mind, once I know what they're asking me for, because usually it would be like, what's the most common? What's the best next step? What's the next imaging need to be ordered? What's the mechanism of action of this drug? What's the side effect? So forth. And then I start reading the stem, so I don't get tripped by the stem, the little triggers and so forth. And this really helped me get through the answers fast and build my stamina. Because the test length increases with every stage throughout the PA school. In didactic, you're going to have tests that are 40, 50 minutes. EORs are going to be 120 minutes, 120 questions in 120 minutes. So you have two hours for 120 questions and the pens is 300 questions. So having that stamina, knowing how to take a good test, how to stay on top of it, it's super important. So let's try some examples, see if this works for you. This is how I would approach it. So let's give it a shot. So once again, read the last sentence first. Which of the following should be the next, not the best, they're asking for a next diagnostic study you should order to evaluate this patient? VQ scan, bronchoscopy, sweat chloride test, x-ray. Now I start reading the stem. A 12-year-old boy presents with, a his presents with a history of an intermittent cough productive of thick purulent sputum. This can be a lot of different things. That is worse than night. So they may want to think about, you know, croup and so forth, thinking you want to need to put the x-ray of the neck. But I want to see what else they got. His mother said it's associated with a wheezing on occasion. That could be an asthma. She's concerned about asthma. Patient has no significant medical history. His older brother has asthma. You perform PFTs, chest x-ray, and cultures. The culture shows 3 plus Pseudomonas arginosa. Right there, I have my answer. So I know the most common cause of cystic fibrosis is Pseudomonas arginosa, which is productive cough of a thick purulent sputum and the best test for cystic fibrosis is a sweat chloride test. I can select that right there and move on. The chest x-ray shows bronchiectasis. Once again, most common cause of bronchiectasis in children, that's a 12 year old boy, it is cystic fibrosis. So again, I'm not going to select any of the, I know the sweat chloride test is the best test for cystic fibrosis. Because, like I just mentioned earlier, most common cause of bronchiectasis in kids in the USA is cystic fibrosis presents with that thick, purulent, foul-smelling sputum, which they didn't mention, but, you know, it's a different question could. That led me to think which test to order was a chloride test. So I know that pseudomonas arginosis is the most common bug in the cystic fibrosis. And I know that VQ scan is something we'll order for pregnant patients if we have an issue of the PE. This is a child, so that VQ is out. Neck x-ray, they try to trip you without wheezing stuff, but everything else that they mentioned uh, points out that that's not the correct answer. Bronchoscopy is a highly invasive and wouldn't help much in this case. So uh, I hope you guys see what I, where my mind is going, how I pick up the answers, and how much it helps me to read the last sentence first. Let's try again with the next question. Which of the following organisms is the most common cause of pneumonia in this patient. Chlamydia, Klebsiella, Mycoplasma, Streptococcus. Every one of these will present a different patient population, so I'm going to start reading the stem and seeing which patient population they're talking about. An elderly man was brought to the ER by EMS in acute respiratory distress, acute onset of fever, altered mental status, less pleasure, chest pain, and cough that is productive. EMS states the patient was picked up in a park found next to a couple of empty bottles of hard liquor. Right there, tells you the patient is an alcoholic, and I know the most common bug causing pneumonia and alcoholic is Klebsiella. I can select this answer and move on right now if I'm, if I'm pressed for time. Patient has a strong alcohol order as you're approaching. On the exam, you note rails, dullness to percussion, increased tactile parameters over the left lung. The answer is Klebsiella pneumonia. 
If they're talking about alcoholic patient, Klebsiella pneumonia is your safe bet. Others are for different patient population. Mycoplasma, we're talking about college dorms, military. Now let's go with another example. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? Acute MI, pulmonary emboli, pericarditis, costochondritis. A 30-year-old female presents to the ER complaining of chest pain for past three days. That is a long time to have an acute MI. Acute MI will present like within minutes, so this one is out right there. States that the pain is constant and that she has a history of lupus and upper respiratory infection a week ago. Her EKG shows a global ST segment elevation. Right there it tells me that's a pericarditis. ST elevation only on certain parts of the will be acute MI. Uh, the S1, Q3, T3 will be pulmonary embolism. And the costal rides, so she will complain about pain if you push on her chest or anything like that, which was not in this vignette. So the pericarditis is a right answer. And again, once again, I hope you see how it helps me reading the last sentence first. Let's try another example. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? Once again, you're going to see these questions like all throughout your PA school. You're going to see in didactic EORs. You're going to see them in pens. So with this in mind, I know what they're asking about is the most likely diagnosis. A fracture of the distal clavicle, calcific tendonitis, biceps tendon rupture, anterior shoulder dislocation. Now I can start reading the stem. A 19-year-old wrestler presents to the ER complaining of shoulder pain. He fell backwards during the practice and used his hands to break a fall. So this is acute injury, so I know this one is out. This is something that develops over time. He expressed that it is extremely painful and that he is unable to move his shoulder. His arm is slightly abducted. That makes me lead towards anterior shoulder dislocation. Biceps tendon, they'll hear a pop, you'll have that Popeye sign, fracture of the distal clavicle, it's really uncommon, you, you know, most clavicle fractures are like mid-clavicles, so this is the most likely answer and I'd stick to it, and anterior shoulder dislocation was the correct answer. Uh, when would you expect a posterior shoulder dislocation? That's a bonus question here. I'm just turn out these bonus questions here. So this is something you'll see in seizures, and also the vignette mentions like electrical shock. People get thrown, they get a posterior shoulder dislocation. <clears throat> Which of the following should be the first diagnostic test order? Not the best, but it's asking for a first. Carotid ultrasound, lumbar puncture, CT brain, MRI brain, both without contrast. Now we can start reading the vignette. A 70-year-old female presents to the ER complaining of the worst headache of her life. Right there... That tells me that this patient is likely having a subarachnoid hemorrhage, and I know the best test for subarachnoid hemorrhage is CT brain without contrast. It is fast, it will show the blood, I can select that without even reading the rest of it and just move on. But let's read it for fun. It reports that she has some mild headache throughout the week. Also reports that she has some nausea and vomiting. On a physical exam, her Glasgow Coma Scale is 15, <clears throat> but she does have a third nerve palsy. Which of the following should be the first diagnostic test to order? This patient has subarachnoid hemorrhage and the first test should be CT. Uh, don't get tripped by a lumbar puncture. This is something that is ordered for subarachnoid hemorrhage if the CT is negative. So the question might have stated the only way I would select this if the question said she had a worse headache of her life, headache for a week, now like acute headache worst ever you did a ct and it was negative but you still are concerned about it then which test would you order in that case i would have said lumbar puncture and the lumbar puncture should be done within 12 hours of her symptoms and we look for xanthochromias in uh, csf mri takes uh, time to obtain so that one will be out this is acute situation and no ultrasound is just no help here uh, next question which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? Intussusception, UTI, appendicitis, pyloric stenosis. 
an eight-year-old female presents with a 24 hours of abdominal pain. She describes that her pain is located in her right lower quadrant and believes that it's starting in the middle, but isn't sure. So the pain is starting in umbilicals and moved to right lower quadrant. I'm thinking of pedicitis, but I want to hear the rest. She prefers to lie motionless. That right there tells me it's appendicitis. In the ER rotations, you may see this. People that stay motionless, it's going to be appendicitis, more than likely, with the description below. People that have kidney stones, they'll be moving all over. They're going to be doing a dance because they want to try to move that stone and try to prevent the pain. So she likes to lie motionless on exam table. She has vomiting episode once at the onset. Her temperature is 101. On a physical exam, there's rebound tenderness. Another tip off to the appendicitis. There's no rebound tenderness in the UTI on a pyloric stenosis on interception. So appendicitis. So you know, like I just mentioned, they're gonna be motionless, they're not gonna be moving, they're not gonna be doing the dance. The pain is gonna be in the right lower quadrant, uh the starting and bilk region, and rebound tenderness. These are all the three things that pointed me out to appendicitis in the stem. What else do I know about appendicitis. Well, it's most commonly caused by fecal obstruction, most common surgical condition in children with abdominal pain, and then you're going to look for all these other signs in a, a vignette. Rosing sign, obturator sign, saw sign, and McBurney point tenderness. And let's try one more example. Uh, and this is what I'm talking about. So you, you have some questions that have a really long stem, longer than this, and you have five questions to go in two minutes left on your exam. So reading the last sentence first, looking over the examples of the uh, answers may help you save some time. Which of the following is the first line management for her condition? So they're asking me whatever she has, what's the first medication I should give her? Propranolol, beta blocker, nifedipine, calcium channel blocker, aspirin, ibuprofen, and spironolactone. So ties that the diuretic. So I started reading a question. A 40-year-old female with a history of scleroderma presents with the color changes to her hand. That right there with the scleroderma and color changes to her hand. I'm thinking Raynaud's and I know the best medication for Raynaud is calcium channel blockers. I can select that and move on without even reading the rest of it. Save some time. But here we go. She states that it always happens when she's exposed to the cold. The patient indicates that when she goes out in the cold weather, her fingers become swollen, white, and painful, and sometimes turn blue. She also states that when she returns inside the house, her fingers turn red and pain slowly goes away. She reports that nobody else in her family has similar issues. She's currently not taking any medications. Which of the following is the first line management of her condition? Raynaud's calcium channel blocker. Everything in the stem points to the Raynaud's phenomenon. Calcium channel blocker is a first line treatment. Beta blocks will worsen her condition and rest are not helpful. So guys, I hope you find this video super helpful. I hope this test taking strategy is something that you can give it a shot. See if it works for you. Maybe it will be a game changer for you in a PA school. Reduce that anxiety just like it reduced for me. And please hit that subscribe button. Hit that notification bell. Hopefully this kind of stuff helps you. And stay tuned. Uh, Help me grow this channel and stay safe in these crazy times. And I'll talk to you guys soon. Bye.